Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 30. That's going to be our text today, verses 20 and 21. And then thumb over to John chapter 14 as a complimentary reading to what we're going to talk about today on what it means to live a life that is full of the Holy Spirit, surrendered to the Lord's leading, plugged in to what God wants to accomplish in our lives. You know, as we begin the new year, we want to take a look at the role of the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives and what it means to live a Spirit-filled life, because that is the essence and that is required to be successful in fulfilling what God has called us to be and do. The series began a couple weeks ago. We talked about the necessity of the Holy Spirit, how it is impossible to please God outside of the influence of the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit, that, that God gives us in the Holy Spirit the ability to do whatever He tells us to do. And today we look at the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is active in leading every believer in God's will. And so as we look at our text today, I want us to remember that the Holy Spirit is the gift of God's presence that is alive and well in every Christian. In the scripture, he's called the paraclete, the one that's called alongside of us to guide us into all truth and give us everything we need to fulfill God's purposes for our lives. So with this in mind, let's read Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 and 21, and John chapter 14. As we do, let's pause and ask for the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today. Father, we come before you today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We come in the assurance that you are here, that you have predetermined this time to meet with us and to disclose to us not only your expectations and your desire from our lives, but to disclose to us your very nature and your character and the gifts that you have overwhelmed us with as a result of your mercy and grace. And we ask now that you'd open up our hearts and open up our minds and open up our lives to receive fully what you have for your people today. I pray, God, you would infuse us with power as we understand your word and seek to put it into practice in our everyday life. And I pray the lamb that was slain would receive the full reward of his suffering in every detail of our lives. Grant this, we ask, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, amen. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, and Isaiah is talking to a people that are continually ignoring and doing the exact opposite of what God's asked them to do, or they want to do what God wants them to do, but do it their way. And here's what he has to say to them after rebuking them in the first 15 verses. Starting in verse 20, he says this, Although the Lord has given you the bread of privation, you've suffered the consequences of your actions by ignoring him and turning it up here. He's given you the water of oppression. He, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. But your eyes will behold your teacher, your ears will hear a word from behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left. And that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at John chapter 14 and see the fulfillment of that promise. Starting in verse 16, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. For you know him because he abides with you and he will be in you because he's in every person who accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Moving on to verse 25, he says, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have spoken to you or said to you. Our focus today will be on how we can better follow the Holy Spirit's leading in our daily lives. And it will require us to renew our commitment, number one, to seek His counsel, to feed His presence, enjoy His fellowship, follow His lead, listen to His promptings, and trust His nature. We start with re renewing our commitment to seek his counsel. And in Isaiah chapter 30, we're actually given pitfalls to avoid 
before giving instructions or the pathway back to fellowship with God. You see, first of all, we see where the Israelites missed it. And number one, they missed it because they excluded God from their game plan. In chapter 30, verse 1, it says, They executed a plan, but they didn't execute my game plan for their lives. The meditation of their heart is what the author is confronting because what filled their mind and what they thought about on a continual basis originated with them and not with God. And I hope we see the unfortunate nature of this kind of living that is all too common in the church today. Their minds were consumed with executing their game plan for life, whether God was in it or not. And that, my friends, is a recipe for disaster. You want to make God laugh? Just tell him your plans. (laughs) And the Bible makes it clear the reason this is true is because God's ways are not our ways. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're greater. They are right. They are beyond us, and they require the work of the Holy Spirit to be realized in our lives. And that's the point the author is making. The only way that we can get into God's plan is to be responsive and sensitive to the Spirit of God that's revealing God and His plan to our lives. So don't fall into the pitfall of excluding God from your daily living and executing your game plan. Secondly, they involved the wrong people in their decision-making process. Look at verse 1. They made an alliance, but not of my spirit. In other words, they committed themselves to and got themselves entangled with people who gave them a false sense of security, who were leading them away from dependence upon God. I remember when I was in college and I had the the privilege of seeing a younger lady at that time was probably, what, 40 in the 70s, but she was probably in her late 50s. And for 22 years, she worked for for Pac Bell. She was from Arkansas and had become accustomed to a nice paycheck, the consistency of a company that was in good standing and provided a healthy living for her. And she felt the call of God to active, full-time ministry. She had a great voice, and she's known as a lady with hats. Her name was Lily Knowles. And so she began to embark on this journey of trusting God to meet her needs. And she said at the beginning it was a very big challenge because she knew that God had gifted her, but she had grown accustomed to counting on that weekly paycheck that came from this company. And she said, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I just need to know that my commitments and the bills will be paid. She felt the leading of the Holy Spirit to leave Pac Bell after 22 years. She wanted to follow the Lord. But she wanted to make sure it was the Lord speaking and not just her making her own plans. And as she sought the Lord's direction and involved him in the decision-making process of what we should all do, the Holy Spirit spoke to her heart and opened her eyes that the tr- for the last 20 years or 22 years, it was really God supplying her needs, giving her a paycheck, and God chose to use Pac Bell to do it. And now for the next 40 years, God was going to supply every need through her singing. That for her was confirmation. And she followed the Spirit's leading and has encouraged untold thousands. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this before, but it is estimated that every single person on earth in the course of their lives, a full life, will influence over 250,000 people in some way or another. And for Lily Knowles, she used that influence to encourage people with this, 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 this story and testimony of dependence upon God that to lead the comforts of what the world provides and embark on a life that trusts in what God provides and follow in his leading. You see, we all too often make alliances with people God and things that God has not called us to make an alliance with. We need to make our alliance with God and the provision of the Holy Spirit and trust him every step of the journey. Thirdly, we see that they had impure motives or that the motives weren't pure, which our author translated as a lifestyle of sin. 
What does he say? He says, adding sin to sin in verse 1. In other words, they are more interested in God giving them what they wanted than building their lives around what God wanted. And here's the point. The Holy Spirit won't let us do that. The work of the Holy Spirit is constantly chiseling away at the very fabric of our being, the very core of our lives. Why? To conform us into the people that God has called us to be, and that is to be like Jesus Christ, our Lord. He will not let us get away with running from His plan and His purpose for our lives. Number four, they turned a deaf ear. They weren't looking for God's answers because they weren't interested in God's answers. So, verse two, they proceeded without consulting God. Verse 9, they refused to listen to instruction. They looked for someone to tell them what they wanted to hear rather than what they needed to hear. And so they surrounded themselves with people in their lives who would, quote-unquote, prophesy an illusion, speak on the behalf of God, but really sharing the desires of man. We see it all around us in the world today. And in so doing, verse 12, they rejected the word of the Lord. In other words, they trusted their own craftiness, what they thought was best, what was safe, what made the most sense, even if it violated the direct word of God. And they suffered greatly as a result. So why does Isaiah bring all this up? He draws it to their attention and to ours as well, so that when the time comes, they will be aware of their sin. Recognize where they missed it get right with God. He says, you want to hear what the Lord says again? You want to experience peace with God again? You want to reconnect with God's desire again? Look at God's desire in verse 18 of chapter 30. It says, therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you, for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all who long for him. Why does God allow all these things to take place? So that we will respond and repent. And in it we see the pathway back to God. Verse 15. He says, you want to get back in line with God and God's spirit speaking and operating in your lives? Here it is in verse 15. In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. This is for all those who long for God. Step number one, turn to God. He says repent. Repent simply means go in a new direction. It's a change of heart that changes the course and changes our minds. It's a change of attitude. I think repentance is best described as change of ownership. I'm not in control of my life any longer. Others aren't in control of my life. Circumstances aren't in control of my life. God is in control of my life. That's repentance. I turn it all over to him. Turning over the reins fully to God. Secondly, be quiet. Listen more and talk less. Sometimes the best prayer is the prayer of David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. God, would you see if there's any hurtful way in me and, and lead me in the everlasting way? What is that petition? That's an desire and request for God to reveal himself to David. Show me where I missed it. Lord, in many ways, I miss it. I don't even know it. I need this sensitivity to you to direct my steps. You see, listening is a sign of respect. We listen when, know, when we know the one we're listening to has something important to say. And can I say the Holy Spirit always has something important to say to his children. So listen. Listen closely. And listen often. May God give us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and wills to apply. One of my favorite sayings from a friend of mine that's not here any longer, Miss Okereke. She said, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you'll listen more and talk less. So listen more. May we feel the full weight of 
God's presence, as indicated in the book of Ecclesiastes, where we inst- we're instructed to enter God's house. When you enter into the presence of the Lord, you're meeting with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And what does King Solomon say? He says, when you enter into the presence of God, let your words be few. Come ready. Listen, God's got more important things to say to us than we have to say to him. Surprise. Come ready to listen. Why does he say this? So we'd be more ready to listen than to speak. More ready to apply than justify. More ready to surrender than take control. You see, that takes us right into the next step. And that's, we get right with God again, and we give him his rightful place when we learn to trust God more completely. In other words, take God at his word. Simply put, God's word is the final answer. So the encouragement here is for us as the people of God to give God's word the weight that it deserves. I remember many years ago reading the story of Frank Koch, who was a naval officer who gave the following illustration. Maybe you've heard others share as well. But I think it bears mentioning on this point here and giving God's word the weight that it deserves. He likened... The challenge of success and pride and an individual in our accomplishments to his own life where he was the captain of a battleship at sea in the routine of maneuvers and under heavy weathers for days. The captain who was worried about the deteriorating weather conditions stayed on the bridge to keep an eye on the, all the activities taking place. One night, the lookout of the, on the bridge suddenly shouted out, Captain, a light bearing on the starboard side. It's, it's a stationary or moving, shouted the captain. The lookout replied that it was stationary. And that meant the battleship was on a dangerous collision course with the other ship. And the captain immediately ordered the signal man to signal the ship we're on a collision a conclu- a collision course excuse me and I advise you to change course 20 degrees east back came the response from the other ship you change course 20 degrees west agitated by the arrogance of this response the captain asked his signalman to shout out another message I'm a captain you change your course 20 degrees east and back came the second response I'm a second-class seaman. You still better change your course 20 degrees west. The captain was furious at that this time. And he shouted to the signalman to send back a final message. I'm a battlefield. Change course 20 degrees right now east. Back came the flashing response. I'm a lighthouse. Change course 20 degrees west. The captain changed course. And when God gives us his word, listen, his word is sure, it's steadfast, it does not change. The Bible tells us with him, there's no shifting shadow. We change course, he's not going to. Give God's word the weight and the authority it deserves. You see, following God is a natural result of learning to trust God. If we're not following closely, It's because we're not trusting fully. And if we aren't trusting, it's because we aren't taking the time to really get to know God. And that's the last step. It says long for Him. You want to get right with God, if you've lost your bearings, you've turned a deaf ear, get back in alignment with the direction of the Holy Spirit, drawing us to Himself and for His will for our lives, then reset our affections. You see, Jesus reminds us that our affections don't have to be driven by our emotions and our feelings. If we set our affection on things above, then we will want what comes from God. If we set our affection on things on earth, then we're going to want what this world has to offer. So set your heart and treasure what only God can provide. It will always keep us in line with Him.
And having said this, it's a reminder for all of us how easy it is to wander from God. How easy it is to wander from God's course for our lives. How easy it is to wander from God's direct word. So we must continually put our hearts and desires in check and remind ourselves of what we have and what we have in store in Christ. And I remind you, what do we have in store in Christ? Paul says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things God has in store for those who love God, for those who put God first, for those who experience God's best for their life. Nothing in this world compares to what we have Give yourself fully to God and His place in our lives. You see, this was a big mistake of the Sadducees. Remember when they sought to trip Jesus up and said, when a man dies and he's had a wife, or, and then he dies and so she gets married and has kids, she, she dies and has an, more kids with another person, he dies and she marries him. And so this woman's had all these different husbands and in heaven, whose husband? Or who will be the husband of this wife? Why did they ask the question? They didn't care about the answer. They just wanted to try and trip Jesus up, like so many people do in our world today. And, and Jesus' response is incredible. It's fascinating. What does he say? He says, you guys don't have any idea what you're talking about. You, you talk about heaven when you know nothing about it. Let me tell you, let me give you a little glimpse of heaven. In heaven, we're going to be like angels. In other words, we are going to be the best version of ourselves. We will not sin. We will not be tainted by sin and we'll have no desire for sin. Everything we experience in heaven will be infinitely greater than what we have on earth. Every relationship will be like a husband-wife relationship. We'll have that same sense of intimacy and knowledge with one another. This great affection and commitment to one another. That's what every relationship will look like. What God has for us blows us anything we could ever think of away. Far exceeds anything we'll experience on earth. Seek his counsel. Secondly, feed his presence. We develop this appetite for God by feeding the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's taking place in John chapter 14. He says the Holy Spirit will do what? He'll bring back to remembrance all the words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. In other words, God will bring back all the words that he's spoken to us through Christ. When Jesus was led into the wilderness, and I want, to, I want you to think about that for a moment. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit did. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't lead Jesus into the wilderness to tempt him. He led Jesus into the wilderness where Jesus would experience temptation. Remember, God doesn't tempt anybody. But God also leads us in places where temptation will come. And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where temptation would come. And from the outset, he models for us how to feed and strengthen the Holy Spirit's influence in our lives. So in the wilderness, just him, the work of the Holy Spirit, and Satan, how does Jesus respond to temptation? He says it is written. And the very first thing he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How do we feed God's presence in our lives? By feeding our hearts and our minds God's word. You want God to be strong in your life? Then feast on his word. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, God's word strengthens the Holy Spirit's influence in our lives. And this has been probably the greatest benefit in my life. God's word has literally walked me through every source of temptation. When I get tempted to coast, the scriptures remind me, Dane, do your best. Present yourself to prove the God who accurately handles the word of truth. When I get tempted to lash out, 
The Bible reminds me, be slow to speak, quick to listen. The anger of a man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. And I repent. It doesn't mean I don't struggle with these things. I'm not tempted by these things. But God's word allows me to walk through them and not let the temptation win out all the time. When I get tempted by lust, I'm reminded in the scriptures to be satisfied with the wife of your youth. I made a covenant with my eyes to not look lustfully at a woman. When I get tempted to lose hope, I'm reminded that God causes all things to work out for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Stand on the word of God. When I get tempted to doubt, I'm reminded my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That God will not allow me to encounter anything in this world that he has given me the resources to overcome. That he who began a good work is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. This is God's word feeding his presence inside of us and it changes the way we respond in the face of temptation. And this is what Jesus is referring to in John chapter 7 when he spake of the Holy Spirit. He says, out of his belly, from his innermost being, will what? Flow rivers of living water. As we feed God's spirit, it transforms what comes out of our lives. And what comes out brings glory and honor to God as an indication of his presence in the life of his people. When we feed the Holy Spirit a healthy dose of God's word, God's word renews and transforms us from the inside out. This is how the inward man is renewed day by day, though the outward man decays or is decaying. 2 Corinthians 4.16. In fact, I want to challenge us. This is a new year, and we have, if you have your bulletins, you can look on the back. It talks about our core four, what we want to give ourselves to. We want to be biblically sound, not only as a church as a whole, but the church is us as people, and that we as people would be biblically sound, that we would be alive spiritually and responsive to the providence of the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day basis, that we'd be Christ-sharing, that in everything we do, we would share Christ with the world, with one another, and that we would live relationally authentic lives. And I want to challenge us that we all have room to grow when it comes to feeding the Holy Spirit God's Word on a day-to-day basis. And I want to challenge you. I don't know where you're at today in your reading, but this year I'm going to challenge you to read more than you have before. Why? you would feed God's spirit on the inside of you, making you strong, giving you the ability of a man renewed, strengthened on a day-to-day basis, equipped for when temptation comes. In fact, on the inside of your bulletin, there's a plan that'll allow you to read through the Bible in a year. And I want to encourage you to consider that. And make it your challenge, personally. And if you fail, no big deal. If you read more than you did last year trying to read the Bible in a year, to God be the glory. You didn't fail. It was successful. But challenge yourself. Renew your mind and your commitment to feed the Holy Spirit a healthy dose of God's word on a day-to-day basis. Because we can't grow or follow his lead without it. Thirdly, so seek his counsel, feed his presence. We must also learn to enjoy his fellowship. That is the essence of John chapter 14. Jesus, is prom- Jesus promises his disciples the comforter. The word here is he promises them the paraclete, the one that's going to call, call the long side and to lead us in the way we should go. We have an onboard resident counselor who will teach us all things, he says. In other words, he'll help us understand what we otherwise would be unable to put together. Only the Holy Spirit allows us to take the worst this world has to offer and respond with the character of Christ. It comes from nowhere else. And it's a testimony to the presence, the comfort, and the peace of God. I remember, again, having a missionary come to our school when I was in college, and I was forever moved by this testimony. I've shared it many times. And every time I share it, people don't like me to share it. Because it gives us a a glimpse of God allowing things that are uncomfortable in our lives and things we don't understand. But this missionary was from Nepal. And she came and she dedicated her life to serving Jesus Christ and letting that nation know that there's a God that loves them and sacrificed for them and offers them a relationship with him personally. 
And whilst they were there, there was a band of thieves. I think there were three young men that broke into where they were staying, beat and killed their husband, beat and almost killed her son and raped her and beat her as well. She was a missionary who had given her heart and given her life and so she said, how do these kinds of things happen to somebody who put God first? She said, fortunately, she was spared and after going through an incredible traumatic event, the band of thieves had left left to her alone to die, really, she called the cab to go into town and go to the hospital. The cab came, picked her up, and take her to the hospital, and she was weeping, trying to put, make sense of all this that had happened, things that don't make sense. And I'll never forget, she described herself in that cab car, weeping, broken, and all of a sudden she just began to sing a song. She lifted up her hands, broken in her body, barely strong enough to do it, and began to sing in moments like these. I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love I don't understand it all. I don't know what took place, why this took place. All I know, God, is I love you. Tears going down her face. And as she's sitting and sharing her testimony to a group of young people that feel called to ministry, here's the challenge she gets to face. Only by the comfort, counsel, and work of the Holy Spirit was she able to muster the strength and the commitment to renew her covenant with God, to endure the worst of man, and give the best of God. She didn't quit the mission field. She sought counsel, and she needed counsel, and she taught, sought the help of brothers and sisters in Christ. More than that, she learned to rest on the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and that no matter what God allowed, what she endured in this world, that God would give her the strength to endure. And she's got an incredible testimony of God's faithfulness. Remember Hebrews? We studied the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and how many were preserved and God saved them from great traumatic events and others were sawn into, eaten by beasts, given their lives for the sake of the gospel. And she was willing to give her life and no matter what happened to her, say, God, whatever the worst of man that I experience, I want to always give your best in return. God help me. How does God do that? Through the strength of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way it happens. We have the onboard resident counselor, the Holy Spirit, to walk us through waters we otherwise could not walk through. It reminds us that regardless of what happens, the Holy Spirit never leaves us and never forsakes us. What's the promise of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14? He will never leave you. He will be with you forever. Permanent. Secure. This continued peace and harmony with God. For some, we have incredible testimonies of what God has spared us from. And I thank God for that. I'm telling you, I thank God for that. Things we've... Had we not gone through by the grace of God, we wouldn't be here today. For others, we have some incredible testimonies of what God has walked us through and allowed us to endure but would have otherwise broken us like Job, God's Spirit gives us what we need for the next step. And in it, God is glorified. You see, God's Spirit gives us what we need for the next step. But for the grace of God, where would any of us be today? In the Holy Spirit, we have a friend who sticks closer than a brother and helps us in our weaknesses. That's the promise of the scriptures. Take full advantage of what the Holy Spirit has each and every day. Like Paul, the Holy Spirit picks us up and helps us better understand 
God's greater purpose. And in doing so, he allows us, in 2 Timothy 4, 5, to be sober. <laughs> that we live in a world that's hell-bent on destroying God and his people. And he says, as a result, endure hardship. Sometimes you're going to go through some difficult things. And how you go through them will be a witness to the presence of God. So, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Whatever is put before you, do it all for the glory and praise of God and do it in the strength of the Almighty. Four and five. Follow his lead and listen to his promptings. How do we surrender and follow the Spirit's lead? Number one, by understanding that God speaks intuitively. I think of Acts chapter 8, and I'm not going to read that. And I want to give us a survey of what takes place throughout the scriptures and how God's spirit moves people. In Acts chapter 8, Philip was sent to Samaria. He was doing a great work for the Lord, and a great number of people were responding, being baptized and being filled with the Holy Spirit, so much so that Peter came, and we talked about it last week, but verified the work. It says, well, who are we to say what God can and cannot do? God's pouring out a spirit here, and they're receiving it. Let's rejoice in that. And Philip was immediately called away, and he went, the Spirit said, to go to an area to, st to stand there and wait, and he did. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch who was passing by who was a servant of Candace the queen. And while he was riding by in his chariot, Philip was instructed just to listen. So he's standing there, and his chariot's driving by, and he can hear the guy reading from the book of Isaiah. And prompted by the Holy Spirit, he goes, what are you reading? And the eunuch tells him, well, I'm reading from the book of Isaiah, but I don't really know what he's talking about. Is he talking about himself, or is he talking about someone else? And Philip said, well, I can't believe you just asked that question. And from that scripture on, it says, he taught him about Jesus. And showed out all pointed to him, and this eunuch accepted the Lord. He heard the word and says, man, if there's water right here, what stops me from being baptized? Philip said, nothing, let's do it. And he was baptized and followed the Lord. Now in 1998, I went to Israel and we were in Haifa and we we're at a little bomb shelter singing praises to God. Now, you want to be at sober heart and mind? Visit Israel. Now, they when you're sleeping at night, you can hear the bombs going off in the surrounding country. It's very disconcerting. It creates a dependence on the Lord. And I remember we were in a bomb shelter. Like, are you kidding me? They just have bomb shelters everywhere. And we go in there and we're singing Amazing Grace a cappella, and the acoustics were incredible. Just mesmerized by what's taking place. And, and all of a sudden, we met a group of Ethiopian Christians who were Jews in this little area of Haifa. And so I got to eat some Ethiopian food. And it was pretty, pretty interesting. But again, what, what, is, what are these guys doing right here in the city of Haifa in Jerusalem? Only to find out that in Ethiopia, there was a group of Christians that date back to when this eunuch traveled back to the king of kings who had an experience with God that so impacted an entire community that 2,000 years later, we're still seeing the fruit of that work. Why? Because Philip was sensitive to the Holy Spirit to go to an area, sit along the road, listen to somebody reading the scripture, ask him a question, what are you reading? And from that moment on, presenting Jesus, God had things in mind, mind spirit, or Philip didn't understand. Three things here, takeaways. Number one, God speaks intuitively he uses our senses when God puts something on your heart do it because you don't know what God has in mind secondly God has salvation in mind whatever God asks us to do he's going to reveal himself to this world so be obedient thirdly God works beyond what meets the eye so don't rule out or rationalize away what God tells us to do. One of my favorite testimonies here, one of the things I want to do this year is I'd love to broadcast the testimonies that are in the sanctuary. The experiences that God has used and to reveal himself to, to so many. 
And one of my favorites is, is Ron's wife, Rebecca. She was raised a Mormon. When she had gotten ill, and wasn't able to attend the Mormon church for a certain length of time and didn't hear anything from them for years. And she told herself that I'm not going to return until somebody gives me a call. I just want to know that I was missed, that I mattered. She never got that call. But in her heart, she longed for relationship with God. And she said, God, if you're real and you want to reveal yourself to me and I can follow you, would you just, will you show me where to go? And so she got in the car, and as she got in the car, she began following another car. She felt the Lord telling her, follow that car. She followed the car for 17 miles, not knowing where she was going, why she was doing it. She followed the car for 70 miles. It pulled into Calvary Chapel in San Dimas. She said, oh, okay. She pulled in there, accepted the Lord, and has been serving Him ever since. Just the faithfulness of God's Spirit leading us and being obedient to Him, He works in ways we cannot see. That's exactly what took place in the life of the Ethiopian through Philip. So here it is. Whatever God says to do, do it. Wherever God says to go, go. Whatever God says to speak, speak. Whenever God says move, move. That's why our, far, our final point is so important. You see, to follow the Holy Spirit's lead, we need to trust the Holy Spirit's nature, His character. The Holy Spirit will never lead us into sin. The Holy Spirit will never lead us outside of God's will. The Holy Spirit will never lead us to violate the Holy Scripture. He says what? Verse 26, he will guide you, in verse 16, he will guide you into all truth. And here's the point. When we don't listen and we ignore and reject everything God is doing on the inside of us to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ, the scriptures call it grieving the Holy Spirit. And we are forever encouraged in the scriptures to get it right by obeying the command here's the simple model for Christian living do not grieve the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you so do not grieve him I believe this is the best counsel for marriages husbands don't grieve the Holy Spirit in the way you treat your wives I don't care what she's done don't grieve the Holy Spirit wives don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't care what your husband does and what your husband's done. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And you will have a successful relationship with our children, with our bosses, with the world. Pretty simple model. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be obedient to Him. That's the pathway to success and victory. So I ask a couple of important questions this morning as I draw a conclusion. Is what we're considering or what we're doing grieving the Holy Spirit? If it is, don't do it. Is what I'm saying and how I'm saying it grieving the Holy Spirit? Then don't say it. And don't say it that way. Is what I'm considering grieving the Holy Spirit? Am I just trying to make things more comfortable and more easy for me? Or am I enabling some things God is calling me to let go of? In either case, if what we're considering grieves the Holy Spirit, then we must consider something else. Nothing is ever worth violating the nature and the presence of God's Spirit living on the inside of His people. When we do, it robs us of joy and peace and strains our relationship with God. God wire it that way so we would surrender more fully to the work of the Holy Spirit. I conclude with this summary. When we have a choice whether, or we have a choice whether or not to follow the Holy Spirit's direction, 
When we know the will of God and don't do it, then we're resisting the Spirit's work in our lives. When we choose to ignore the conviction of the Spirit and do things our way, we grieve the Spirit of God. And why this is so important is because the Holy Spirit will never lead us to sin. And our sin nature will never lead us in the ways of God. So habitual sin will always cause us to mid out, miss out on what the Spirit has for us. And one of the greatest things about being in tune with God's Spirit is a constant turning from and confession of sin. And with it comes an incre- increased desire and discipline in the habit of prayer and study of God's Word. Because that's how we recognize the leading of God's Spirit. God's Spirit puts within us a healthy appetite for prayer, communion with the Father, and a healthy appetite for God's Word so that we have communication with the Father. Take away today. The Holy Spirit is speaking to all of our lives today. That is what He does, and that is what that is God's gift to us. Learn to be more sensitive, more attentive, more compliant, and more surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Renew your commitment to seek His counsel, feed His presence, enjoy His fellowship, follow His lead, listen to His promptings, and trust His nature. God is not asking us to try harder to live a Christ-centered life. He's asking us to surrender more fully to the Holy Spirit, and we will live a more Christ-centered life. Surrender today. Let's all stand. And as we do, I'm going to ask you to close your, your eyes and bow your head. Father, I thank you for this appointment with you today. I thank you that your, your word and your truth is alive and well, and that the Holy Spirit on a day-to-day basis week-to-week basis, month-to-month, year-to-year, whenever we have a ten of years, you're there speaking, wooing us to yourself. And I pray today you would get our full attention. And Lord, that we would respond to your heart, that heart that longs to be compassionate, longs to overwhelm your people with grace and goodness incredible gifts, even when life's difficult, the goodness of the Lord never changes. And I pray today, God, that you would woo us to lay down every barrier, anything and everything that gets in the way of surrendering more fully to you. Today we say, God, take the reins. I'm I'm tired living life my way, trying to get you to do what I want you to do. God, help me. Help me to do what you want me to do. Understanding that that's the pathway to the greatest fulfillment, the greatest satisfaction, and the greatest life that can ever be lived. And Lord, when this world gives us its worst, Lord, help us to give your best in return. Go beyond us from the inside out, transform us and allow us to be everything Jesus, you intend us to be. Grant this, I pray. Grant this, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name. As we close this morning, can you just lift your hands and surrender and let's ask and let's allow the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and speak to our lives and transform us. Thank you.